So I guess it's traditional for keynote speakers to say I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm just excited to be back in the Bay Area. I've been traveling a lot. So, um, so um, I'd like to work, I'm an academic, and I like to work between disciplines and sort of see what's not quite fitting together uh, and where the challenges are. Um, the title of AI researcher has been bestowed on me for years, and I don't think of myself as AI researcher. I think AI is a wonderful aspiration. We don't have it yet, and I don't think it's really a thing to focus on. So what I've been focusing on for about 20 years is statistics meets computer science, and specifically not AI, not robots and vision and, and so on. That's interesting, but uh, systems meets statistics. And I think that's actually what this community is mostly about. Um, so what's missing in, in systems meet statistics? Well, lots of things are missing. You know, all the scalability issues and control of errors and stuff. We, they've been, these issues have been present in the previous talks. They're still not really solved. We're working on them. Um, but also, there's a whole economics perspective, which I think is basically entirely missing. And I think if you start to think about the real world where goods and producers and consumers and resources live, not just the virtual world of platforms and computer science, you have to bring economics into the picture. Okay, so uh, here's my kind of uh, slightly personal view of what has happened in the last few decades. Uh, first of all, this is not about artificial intelligence. We don't have intelligence yet. It's about machine learning. Um, and the first generation was the back end. I think Amazon represents this particularly well, doing fraud detection well. You know, search was more Google and so on. Supply chain management, all this was statistics and data. That was already in the 90s. So you didn't read about it in the newspapers, but it was already fully there, and it, made, it drove these companies. Uh, then, you know, you built platforms that uh, served people. A lot of these uh, companies were interested in that, so they brought the machine learning forward into the, into the service of people. Um, the third generation where I think a lot of the focus is now is sort of verticals, the end-to-end -end systems that do some task, like computer vision or something. And I think people are still scrambling around a bit to find out what to use those things for. Um, and I, I think what's emerging really recently is, is systems that are broader than a single entity that does something like an AI system. That's something involving many, many entities together. All right, so I've written an op-ed recently. It's listed down there at the bottom uh, where I try to dig into this terminology bit. I think it's actually important to think about what problems to work on. To, you know, what do we mean by these terms? And so AI, the original aspiration was an autonomous system that looks like one of us, like a robot that you know, is intelligent. And I think that autonomy word is, is the problem. We don't really want autonomous systems. That sort of is a show off, hey, I've got it to work because I don't even have to hold, you know, hold on to its hand, it just works. We really want systems that work well in the context of other systems, including humans, right? That's what we really are missing if we think to focus too much on autonomy. So I think what's really happened actually in the last 30, 40, 50 years is these IA systems, ones that help humans, that themselves aren't super intelligent, they just process data and find patterns that humans can make use of. And so search engines are definitely that. Um, but all these you know, natural language translation systems, they're not doing anything intelligent, they're just mapping strings to strings, but humans find it useful. And many other examples like that. But I think also emerging in this period of time has been this you know, internet of things meets statistics putting things on the internet, getting data streams going, but then using them for something, not just getting the data moving, but using it for something. So I'm gonna call that II. Um, so what are the kind of problems that rise? Well, first of all, I think that there's been a disconnect, is that people think that this AI revolution is all about machine learning for problems like computer vision and, and uh, you know, NLP and, and so on, and that's fine, but that's the very human imitative perspective. We're trying to build systems that humans didn't evolve to, to think about. Um, moving lots of cars around or doing, you know, uh, personalized medicine and so on. Um, maybe we're making 100,000 decisions per second. Humans didn't evolve to do that. We're not good at it, right? So building a human imitative AI is actually a mistake if you're thinking about it that way. So uh, this phrase, um, I, I believe in. To make an overall system behave intelligently, it's neither necessary nor sufficient to make each component in the system be intelligent, right? So if I could create a human being, um, and then put it in the context of an overall economic system, it might not perform very well, okay? Um, so um, I think this perspective is, is really important if you start to think about what are some of the challenges. This is a big boring slide I'm not gonna go through uh, in detail, but these are some of the challenges that I work on and many people in the people, you know, the sub-community I belong to work on, and if you'll look at them, many of them are about systems. They're not about an individual AI, you know, an AI um, entity. 
okay? And they're not the kind of list that you typically get in, you know, uh, the AI literature. So multiple decisions, and now I don't just mean like, uh, you know, a sequence of decisions like a robot has to do. I mean a, a million decisions simultaneously, like if I'm building a system to do uh, personalized medicine, it's not just about the one doctor interacting with the one patient. It's about the million people that day that had medical data being coming into the system, being used for predictions, being used for diagnoses and so on, and that happens year round, and a million decisions are made in that day. And if there's an error that makes them all correlated in some bad way, I could have a disaster, okay? In the financial system, we see disasters when correlated errors uh, are present. In the political science literature, we see these kind of problems. In transportation, we see them. So it's not about the individualized decision of an agent with a human or an agent with another agent. It's about the systems of agents that we have to think about. So we have to create markets. We need to be able to share data around our markets. This is not a classical AI problem, but it's critical in our emerging world. Privacy and data ownership have to do with systems of agents, not just with single ones. Um, uncertainty is everywhere, but machine learning doesn't focus on it enough. Okay? They sort of eventually say statistics when they have to think about uncertainty, but mostly machine learning, black box, input comes in, output comes out, no uncertainty, no error bars, even to this day. So we're missing lots and lots here, folks. Um, cloud edge interactions has to do with systems, all right? not just merely um, so for building a system to do self-driving cars, we have to have lots of concern about where's the intelligence. It's partly in the cars, but some, there's different knowledge in different cars, and it has to go up and get integrated. Again, that's not a classical AI problem, but it's very much important. So I can keep on going, but I, see, I hope you see these are really the core engineering problems if you're really trying to build a discipline, whatever you want to call it, AI if you want to call it that. But this is the emerging engineering discipline that we don't have yet, okay, that we need to build. All right, so I think to start, you know, you start working on all of these things individually, but it's also nice to take a broader perspective on what are the, some of the um, challenges present in all of these issues. And, and as I scan through them, I see economics kind of you know, rising its head up. Um, so I think that uh, in economics, you study uh, resources. Uh, computer scientists are familiar with that, but I particularly focus on scarcity. What happens if you're just trying to distribute resources, maybe labor market, maybe um, you know, uh, food, um, maybe any kind of service, and there's scarcity. You ha don't have enough for everybody. How do you do that in a way that at least there's some notion of fairness? All right. Um, so I think that blending machine learning, or really I think of it as statistics, with economics is, uh, is not, there's not been enough focus on that, and I want to I focus on that. So let's take an example that will help uh, give you an idea of some of the issues I think about here. So think about recommendation systems. I think these were actually really important. Um, this is some of the things that, you know, uh, Google, sorry, that uh, Amazon and, and, and Netflix and all did really, really well, and it added a value to computers in ways that wasn't present before. And it wasn't really an AI capability. Humans didn't evolve to make vast numbers of recommendations, um, but the computers were able to do that. Um, but they were built in this kind of AI style. You thought about one person came in, uh, a feature vector was formed, and went into this black box, and out came the list of recommendations. Right? So if Jan Stoika does that in the morning, he might get recommended some book. I come in the next day, I'm completely independent of him. The feature vector is formed for me, it goes into the same black box and out comes a list of recommendations. And we tune the knobs of that thing over time to make it somehow better and better. All right? But we're not thinking about um, the deeper problem of interacting decisions. We're thinking about one at a time. So we're thinking about the only way to improve this system to make the recommendations better and better is to have the AI have a deeper understanding of me. So we go to all the really hard AI problems of what do I intend to do, what are my preferences, what do I care about in the world and all. And most companies that try to go that path just don't do, get there. That's hard. Okay? You need huge amounts of data, we, and no company has that kind of you know, fine-grained data. All right? And in fact, there's really a scarcity issue that's being ignored here if you're thinking about this more generally. Scarcity is always present in the real world, and so we need to actually think about not one system, one person at a time, but a market. All right, so think about recommending a movie to somebody. Suppose that Jan Stoika gets recommended a certain movie, and then later that day I get recommended the same movie. Is that a problem? Well, no, I just copy the bits. He gets the bits, I get the bits. Whoever comes on the system and gets that movie recommendation, well, I could do it 100,000 times today, and it's no problem. All right, what if I recommend the same book to everybody? Probably not a problem for Amazon. They've got enough books in stock, or they can do print on demand. That's a technology that exists. And us computer scientists are just sort of used to that. Anything can be done on demand, right? But what if I recommend the same restaurant to everybody? Now I'm starting to recommend things out in the real world, not just virtually, 
All right. Well, there's scarcity. I can't recommend this. If I recommend in this area of town the same restaurant tonight to everybody in your app, in this room, you're going to all go there, and there's you know there's going to be a line, and there's not you're going to fill up all the seats, and everybody's going to be unhappy. All right. And if, how do you fix that? Well, you don't build the world's best system that understands all of your motivations and all the restaurants and all that and figures it all out. That's central planning. That's what failed in the Soviet Union. It doesn't work. Seriously. All right, you have to build a market where the people who have the resource, the seats in the restaurant, make bids for the people that might come in. And uh, economic value is created. And you can even start to price those things and actually have a system that actually starts to work. All right. What if you recommend the same street to everybody? To get to the airport from here to there, here's the best street to go down. All right? Well, you hope you see the problem. You create congestion. Well, that's the same phenomenon. We're not thinking about the system. You could create a super system that worked all that out with some dynamic programming or something, but it's not going to scale. It's not going to really work. All right? You have to create a market where there's bidding and, and, um, and prices. And here's even a better example, I think. So in China right now, everybody has a little bit of money for the first time in their lives. Um, so you've got uh, you know, systems that have 500 million people on the platform, WeChat, um, Alipay, and so on. And they're trying to help people to make financial decisions with their little bits of money, because the banks haven't really cared about you know, the vast long tail. Um, so what if I recommend today to 500 million people on my platform to buy some stock, to buy Databricks? <laughs> well, Databricks will shoot up artificially. I will destabilize the market. Right? And this will happen. I guarantee it. It's going to happen. And we just need to kind of avoid things like that. And now the medical things that we were talking about earlier in the day, same kind of things. If I recommend a, a treatment that, you know, that, that's, there's errors in that, I'm going to create a problem. So this is a load balancing aspect of multiple decisions, which is not being focused on, but which you can focus on with market ideas. So whenever you have data flowing between producers and consumers, you can create economic value. So it's not just about the data, all right? If it's data between a producer and a consumer, that can be priced. That can be create economic value. Okay, so if you do this, this is a way actually to create jobs with AI, not take away jobs. So I'm going to give you an example uh, of a real company that I'm on the scientific advisory board um, um, with, uh, with several others, including Ben Horowitz. Um, uh, both of us are very excited about music meets technology. Um, so more people are making music than ever before. You may or may not know that, but a lot of people go home on the weekends. They drive a taxi during the week. They go home on the weekend, and on their laptop, they create really good music, some of them. Um, they'd love to be a musician, probably, but they can't do it because they get no money for that. Uh, their music goes up on SoundCloud, where services like Pandora and so on stream it at people, and, and more people are listening to music than ever before, not just the famous musicians, but all this other stuff. But there's no market. Data is sort of flowing, but not really. No one's capturing it, really. And therefore, no prices are being set. All right? So, so that's broken. We should be able to create music uh, value out of this system. It'll be a better system. All right, so there's a company that is trying to do this. United Masters is the name. It, it, uh, in, in November, it was announced. It partners with sites that have the data. Uh, it uses ML or statistics to figure out which people listen to which musicians. Okay, that's not all that hard if you have the API for, say, YouTube. Um, and now, knowing that, I can tell a musician, here's a dashboard, and here is the map of the United States. Here's all the people that listened to you in the last week. And maybe you look and say, my God, 10,000 people in Jacksonville, Florida listen to me. They, they love me there for some unknown reason. Or maybe somebody liked me and told their friends and everything. So what do I do is I make a little trip to Jacksonville, I give a concert, and I make $25,000. And I do that three times during the year, and that's a salary. And I can quit my taxi job, and I can start to actually work as a musician. I'm not going to become the famous Beyonce person, but I will uh, make enough money to be a musician. Moreover, now that I have data, I can make more offers. Once a musician knows, here's some people that listen to me, the musician can say, hey, I'll play your wedding for $10,000, or your son's bar mitzvah, or something like that, okay? Bids can make, uh, you're a VIP person, you can come backstage. Um, we create a market, and the company doesn't, it isn't the one providing the service. The company's just creating the platform, the market platform, however, not the platform that serves the stuff, the content, just creates the market. And of course, they can take some 5% of that and make a ton of money. Um, now, um, if you think about multiple decisions, um, it's not just about the load balancing. That's kind of a CS issue being solved, I would argue, with markets. But it's also about the statistical issues. Um, and so here's kind of a nice little cartoon that I love that uh, gets into this. Um, someone says, jelly beans cause acne. That's a hypothesis. People investigate by doing a randomized test. They find, nope, p-value is greater than 0.05, nothing, you know. 
If that were the end of it, if it's just one decision made with one agent, fine. But it's never one decision made with one agent. Someone comes back in the room and says, oh, it's a certain color that causes it. So then people go out and test all the different colors of jelly beans, and now you know what's going to happen. By chance alone, I'll put kind of the people with bad skin condition in, in the treatment and the others in the control, and I'm going to come up with a result, which is that one of them came out to be true just by chance alone. Now, this is very common knowledge to statisticians, but it's just not well appreciated. And we start to build systems that make hundreds of thousands of decisions. By chance alone, a lot of them will be false. So there's things called false discovery rate, with deal, which deal with this, but they have their own limitations, and a lot of work is needed. So systems people need to put ideas like FDR in their systems, not think about it as something you add at the end. It's got to be a core part of the system. So that was in my list of challenges there. And what my big overall challenge here is, is that systems people should go through that list and not just ask, have I implemented neural nets? Have I implemented you know, this technology or this technology? Rather, have I faced some of these challenges? Because these are the ones that arise in the real world. Thank you very much.